All right, I'm going to miss that little Summer of Love video. Uh, it's great to see everybody. If you are uh, here at our Legacy Campus, whether you're here for the first time or you're a longtime Chase Oaker, really, really glad that you're here, as well as those of you who are at one of our other campuses, those at 544, uh, where my wife is uh, working with your kids right now, or Sloan Creek, or those of you who are online, um, or also shout out to N. S. Uh We're kind of one big happy family, you know, one church with multiple campuses, and, and really glad that you are part of the family today. As we do, as we do kind of put a, uh, the last week, or we did last week of Summer of Love, um, which is a little sad, but next week we start a new series, which I'm also excited about, and that's called Born to be Wild. And uh, Greg and Blake and I will be doing that one, and it's, it's really about not the big names in the Bible, but some of the obscure characters of the Bible, ordinary people who make some extraordinary decisions with extraordinary impact. And if you feel more ordinary than superheroic, then I think it's going to be a really great, great series. So today, though, we finish out our Summer of Love series, where we've really taken the heart of the summer to focus on the love of God for us. The most profound thing we can know about God is His love. It's the most difficult part of His character to fully understand. In fact, we'll, I think, spend all eternity trying to appreciate that. And it's also the most transformative part of His character to understand once we do. Kind of our prayer through this series has been Paul prayers and Paul's prayer in Ephesians uh, for the church, Ephesians 3, that God would help us, that God would empower us to somehow be able to grasp how high and wide and long and deep is his love for us so that we can know the fullness of God. And we've looked at a number of pictures of God's love for us. Today is a major implication of his love to know and appreciate that really would change if we really understand and believe what we're about to say, would definitely change the way we relate to God, the way we talk to him, the way we pray, certainly, because we're talking today about the generosity of God. I anybody who loves is generous. They're, that's what love does. So love gives, love shares. And what Jesus is going to let us know today is that God, as the ultimate uh, being of love, is also the crazy, most crazy generous being on the planet. Now, I don't know if you have crazy, generous people in your life or know people like that. There's a number of them around Chase Oaks, so I bet you do. But, uh, you yeah, know, these are the kind of people you have to be a little careful with because they're literally the kind of people who will do anything if they know you have a need. My dad was like that. Like, if you, if you just hinted at a need, he was going to do whatever he could to help make that happen. Um, he was a picture of crazy generosity. Another picture of crazy generosity in my life uh, gets me to this duck. Uh, this little duck, actually they really do keep their heads this way, it's not broken or smushed, uh, but this little duck is only found in the delta of the Danube River that goes into the Black Sea in Romania, and the reason I got it uh, was because of crazy generosity. So I was in Romania the summer after I graduated from high school, spent most of the summer in that country in Hungary, and we were going into these communist bloc countries, you know, the, it was communist in those days. And we were going to provide training and resourcing covertly to uh, children's workers, people who taught children about Jesus, which was actually against the law in Romania to do that. And we were going to help facilitate that. And the people that we interacted with, especially in Romania, because the persecution against Christians was so strong, uh, just marked me for forever because of their joy and also their incredible generosity, which is how I got the duck. So here's what happened. So we, I was 18 years old. Uh, the person I was traveling with was uh, older than that. And I was picky as an 18-year-old in terms of food. He was not picky at all. He would eat anything. And so we knew that there were a couple times I'd probably struggle as we go into these homes and all that. And so we developed a little system that if I was really like something was totally disgusting and I just couldn't do it, that I'd start, I, I would, we'd have this little signal, kind of the alarm signal, and he would start eating his food really fast. I would eat my food really slow, really just kind of push it around. And then we would create a diversion, uh, get everybody to look another way and switch plates. It might, his, you know, right, my full one for his empty one. So this was only, we only did it two times. So this was the second time and created it to create a diversion. I, I, you know, there were, on the mantle were all these 
uh, birds, stuffed birds like this. And I said, wow, look at those birds. Everybody at the table, look at those birds. Just look at all, like look at them really good. And everybody's looking at them. We switch plates, everything works. And Florin, our host, said, well, which one do you like the most? And I said, oh, well, no, no, I, I just, I just, I think they're great. Well, which one do you like the most? Because if you like it, I would like you to have it. And what I learned is in Romania with Christians there, if you compliment something, guess what? You're going to own it because they're, that's just their generosity. And so I ended up trying to leave the country with this bird, which actually caused a big problem at the border because you weren't supposed to have anything like this. And how did you get it? And he put his name on it. They were actually able to trace it back to him. Um, it ended up being a good thing, but they actually got deported from the country, which I know doesn't sound great, uh, but they did end up in Chicago and are happy and are doing life well there. I'm just saying be careful if you invite me over for dinner, I guess. Um, <laughs> but again, I learned, right, the, the, how crazy generosity works. And you kind of adjust when you're dealing with a crazy, generous person. And Jesus is going to say, let us know how crazy, generous God is and it really should or would, if we believe that, adjust the way we relate to him. Certainly, I think we would pray a whole lot more. If we really understood the crazy generosity of God, we would pray a whole lot more when we understand his, his whole bent toward us and his inclination to give. And yet, even as I say that, it can be confusing. And some of us right now are in that confusion of unanswered prayer. Because I think it's easy to say, okay, yeah, I, I know God is generous and all that, and I, it seems to work for other people, but man, I've been praying about something for a long time, and God's not doing anything. Like, I know he's supposed to be generous, but it's just not working. And that's why sometimes people get disillusioned with God and get disillusioned with prayer, because it's not working. God's not answering. And some of you are praying about some big things in your life. You're praying about maybe your marriage that, that could be better. Or maybe you're praying to be married, or you're praying uh, for a child, uh, for, to be able to have children, or something in the life of a child, or you're praying for a dating relationship, or a friendship, or a work thing, or you're praying for a job, or you're praying for a health issue in your own life, or in the life of somebody you love for healing, and God just doesn't seem to be answering. And why not? And so today, we're going to look not only at the generosity of God, but also at the mystery of unanswered prayer. So with that in mind, let's go to Luke chapter 11 in the New Testament. Uh, the Bible is Old Testament, New Testament. We're going to be in the New Testament. Luke is uh, third book in the New Testament, if you want to follow in your Bible or Bible app. And what, it's a cool passage because the disciples, Jesus' 12 disciples, ask Jesus a question. And they say, Lord, we want you to teach us something. Now, this is the only record we have in the New Testament of the disciples specifically asking Jesus to teach them something. They may have done it, and it's just not recorded, but it seems that the most remarkable thing about Jesus to them wasn't, he didn't, they don't say, Lord, teach us to teach like you do. Lord, teach us to do miracles like you do. God, teach us to heal people like you do. Teach us to drive out demons like you do. They say, Lord, teach us to pray like you do. And he obliges and he gives what we know as the, or what we often call the Lord's Prayer. You may have heard it in King James, because that's how we hear it a lot if you've been around weddings or church or anything. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, and so on. That's the model prayer. Hey, here's how to pray. But then he's going to say, now let me teach you to pray. Like motivation to actually pray. And he's going to do that by demonstrating God's character. Now he starts with a story and the story, the parable, to help us understand God's character, I think is the most misunderstood parable of all of Jesus' parable, uh, parables, the most misunderstood story of all of Jesus' stories. And there's some reasons for that. Because when we try to listen to this story with a Western mindset, and most of us grew up in a Western culture, some of you grew up in Eastern cultures, so you get a head start today on this to understand the story. It's really hard to understand it. And, and I think even the translators of the passage we'll look at, of the translation from the original language in the Bible in the New Testament Greek, I think messed up just looking at it from a Western translation, and that doesn't help. So we're just going to look at it, we're going to read it, and take it at face value, and then kind of dig deeper and say, hey, let's think about this from a different mindset, clear up the translation problem. All right, we ready? We have to use our brain. I know it's summer, but we can do this, okay? It's going to be, we, we can do it. Here's the story, first of all. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend, 
and you go to him at midnight and say, so you're going to his house, knock on the door, friend, let me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me like an unexpected person came, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside the house answers, don't bother me. The door's already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Now, if you're following what Jesus is saying, because he's talking about prayer, and you know he's talking about prayer, then the picture we get of prayer is this, that prayer is like you and me. When we have a need, we go to God, and God is like the grumpy neighbor. And we knock on the door, and God's attitude is like, go away. I don't want to do anything for you. This is not, you know, it's an imposition. Go away. And yet, if you keep being shameless in your audacity, and you keep knocking, and you keep pounding on that door, then eventually you'll wear God down, and God will say, okay, good grief. I guess I'll do this thing for this person. Tells the angels or whatever, just do something for this moron, because I'm tired of this person. Just go do it. And that's what prayer is. That's not what prayer is, and that's not what God was saying. It's not what Jesus was saying, which is why all the next verses are exactly the opposite of that. So what's going on? Well, I want us to go back and kind of try to listen to the story in the same Eastern mindset that the disciples, all in a Middle Eastern culture, would have heard it. We'll clear up the translation thing, too, and you realize, oh, that's what he's saying. And it's complete opposite of what we just did. But first, we need a little bit of a lesson in Western culture and Western mindset versus Eastern mindset. Now, again, if some of you are from Eastern mindset cultures, so you get kind of a, you get a head start today. But here's one of the big differences between the two that we need to understand under the sta- understand the story. The first is that Eastern cultures are way more hospitality cultures than Western cultures are. Now, I know some of you in the West, you're like, you, man, I, I'm hospitable, that's important, and, I, and it, you know, I get that. But in an Eastern mindset, in Eastern cultures, just generosity goes to a whole new level of depth in that culture, um, which is, and just the, the responsibility, the code of generosity, the cultural expectation, it's just at a whole other level than in a Western culture. That's why when, uh, because of that, when Christy and I went to China a year or two ago, we gained like 15 pounds in a week because in that culture, in hospitality, you're obligated, like it's just part of it, you give way more food than anybody could possibly eat. We were like, well, we better eat it because they keep serving it. And, like, and so we just kept gaining weight, right? Because we just come at it from a different mindset. But it goes even deeper than food. In Eastern cultures, like in, in the Middle East and other cultures in which Jesus uh, and the disciples were you know, raised up in, um, there is a, a code even to this day in those cultures of hospitality that it's not just about food, but about protection and about care. If you saw the movie Lone Survivor, did you see that movie? about the Navy SEALs and, and only one survives and he is wounded and he goes into that village um, in Afghanistan or Pakistan, I can't remember which one, and goes in there, I guess it was Afghanistan, and they take care of him and all that. Well, once they receive him into the village, he's under their hospitality and therefore they're obligated not only to care for him, but they're culturally obligated to protect him against any enemy, even though they don't know him. So when the Taliban comes and attacks them, they don't give him up because he's theirs. It's hospitality. And they fight not because of some political thing. They fight because of this deep-seated code of hospitality. It's just like in their culture. It's in their blood. It's what they do. So remember that because that's the kind of hospitality culture we're talking about. The second really big difference is about motivation, like how you make a decision about right and wrong, how you make a decision of what's best or what I'm going to do, even though it may be an imposition. From a Western mindset, we make those decisions more individually and in a guilt-based way, where as a Western culture, individualistic and guilt-based. What I mean by that is by individualistic, we have our conscience And we make decisions about right and wrong based on our conscience, what we believe, what we feel is right. And therefore, we don't want to violate our conscience. And if we do, we will be personally guilty and we will be held accountable personally with those those consequences. And that motivates us. And Eastern cultures are motivated differently. Not as individual as much as communal and shame-based rather than guilt-based. 
So what I mean by communal is that it's not so much just me and my uh, feeling of right and wrong, my conscience that I don't want to violate. It's community norms. It's community expectations. And I don't want to violate those in a way that would bring shame on my name or shame on my family or shame on my village. That's why uh, sometimes it's called saving face or, or protecting face or not wanting to lose face. It, it's, I, I don't want to bring shame on my family by violating what, or shame, or shame on anything, my family, my culture, my village, my family name, by not doing what culture expects me to do. So with that in mind, we're going to go back and look at it. Remember that shame-oriented thing, because that'll become really important. So I'm going to go back and tell the story from that perspective. So here's the story. You are late at night, let's say it's midnight, and a friend knocks, somebody knocks at the door, uh, maybe you didn't realize they were coming, and it's midnight, and you don't have any food, they're hungry, they've been traveling all day and all night, and what are you going to do? Now, in our culture, be like, well, you tell them, Goober, why didn't you let us know? We don't have any food. You're just going to have to wait till morning. But in that culture, that was unthinkable because of the deep-seated code of hospitality. They have to do something. Now, they can't just go to Whataburger for the 24-hour drive through because it doesn't exist. So they have to go to a neighbor's house. And they knock on the neighbor's house and, and say, here's my dilemma. And, and Jesus says, suppose your neighbor says, go away. My kid's already in bed. I can't help you now. And we hear that in a Western culture and think, well, yeah, that's kind of what I'd want to say. You know, go away, you dummy. I don't want to talk to you right now. You're waking up my kids. But in that culture, it even says, suppose, we, they, they would have laughed at that. They would have known it was a hypothetical statement, not a real statement, which is why the guy does feed, give the food because it's a hypothetical statement. Nobody would have said that. Nobody in that culture would have said, well, go away, I'm not, I can't help you and all that. That would have been unthinkable. And it would have been unthinkable because of the code of hospitality and the deep-seated desire to not bring shame on my family, not bring shame on my, my name. Which gets us to the response again. He says, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because... Of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. This is the translation problem. Now, again, I know we're using our brain today in the summer. Are you with me? Campuses, I hope you're with me too at home. Your shameless audacity. Um, from a Western mindset, this makes sense. This is a really hard word from the original language of the New Testament Greek to know how to translate. But one thing we need to know is that the word your right there is not in the original language. That was a translation decision. And you have to make a decision of what this, whatever this is, which I think is an unfortunate translation, but whatever this is, does it belong to the one asking, knocking on the door of the neighbor, or the neighbor, does it belong to them? And grammatically, there's a much stronger argument that it doesn't belong to the one asking, but the one being asked. It's about his motivation, what something in him, not the asker. And what that is, is shameless audacity, is the way the NIV translates it. But I think, again, I, I understand why they would translate it that way, because if you're looking at this from a Western mindset, and it's a weird word, and it must mean something like this. The Greek word is anadeon, and you don't have to know that as much. It's just to understand it's a really rare word in the Greek, and it was a word that the Greeks used to try to understand, again, Greeks are Western, try to understand their Eastern neighbors people like Israel and the Jews and all that, to try to understand this thing that we're talking about, about shame, and about wanting to avoid shame, and about saving face. And therefore, this is not about shameless audacity, you just got to keep knocking because God's a grumpy neighbor. That's not the point. What he's saying is God is a good neighbor, and he will respond to avoid bringing shame on his name. He will do the right thing. So if we paraphrase it, here it is. Your friend may not respond to your request out of friendship, but he will respond, this is my paraphrase of this, to avoid shame, to save face, and to honor the code of hospitality. Meaning God is not the grumpy neighbor, God is a good neighbor who's going to do the right thing, always. Which is why what Jesus says next makes a whole lot more sense. He says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. 
For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks the door will be open. Doesn't that make more sense? At least humor me. Doesn't that make more sense? Amen. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, he's, that God is not a grumpy neighbor who wants you to go away. He's a good neighbor who loves you, who will always open the door for you, who will always give when you ask, and who all, you always find when you seek. Now, I know some are thinking, well, I don't know, because I'm asking, and it's not happening, and we'll get there. But Jesus is going to take it up a notch even further. He's not only going to say, hey, God is like a, a neighbor who does the right thing. It's actually better than that. That God is like a really, really good father, because he is, a really, really good father who is always inclined to do what's best for his children and to give good things to his children. So he says next, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? So your son's hungry and wants an egg and instead... Here's a live scorpion, eat that. No, what kind of dad's gonna do that, right? That would be a really bad dad, and those exist, but most of us are not bad dads, or if you grew up with a dad, hopefully your dad was a good dad, or even if you're not a dad, imagine being a dad, and your little kid comes up and wants something. You're not gonna give something dangerous to them or bad to them, because your inclination is to give. And so Jesus says, if you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. That just he appeals to our inclination as parents to want to do good things for our kids. Like like with me, with my uh, with my kids. You know, I have two that are two boys, Colin and Caleb. Uh, my youngest is now 21, who's mostly grown. He's still on the payroll, so I wouldn't call I won't call him grown quite yet, but getting close. He's a junior in college. Um, and so and then uh, Colin, and then Colin married Kinsey, so now I have a daughter-in-law, which is awesome. So Whenever one of those three call me, my three kids, whether it's Colin or Caleb or Kinsey, and I see their name on my caller ID, I'm not like, oh, good grief. Them again? I'm going to have to change my number. Why do these people keep calling me? I mean, what, good. I, right? I'm not like that. I'm like, oh, it's awesome. I just, I'm so happy I get to hear their voice. And I'm inclined, if there's a need or if there's a request, everything in me like wants to do whatever I can do to meet that. And that's what Jesus is saying. It, it, but notice, if we go back, he kind of gets a dig is what it feels like. He says, if you then, though you are evil, respond that way. And you're like, well, what up with that? What do you mean if you're, you're like, though, though you are evil? Why does Jesus call you and me evil? You know why? Because we are. That's why. And what he's talking about is our sin nature, that, that God doesn't have a sin nature, but we do. And in our sin nature, we are selfish, and we're impatient, and we have limits to our generosity, and we have limits to what we, how we love, and all that. And all of us do, even the best parents do. But God has none of that. God has no selfishness. God has no impatience. God has no limit to his love and to his generosity for us. And therefore, when we come to him as our father, he loves with a love that we can relate to, but is way above what we can actually understand and know. And that's how, that's how God loves. But notice what he gives. It's a little different than we might think. He said, if you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give what? The Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Now, what's up with that? Because you're like, like, what does that even mean? Like, hey, I'm praying for a, like a car. <laughs> you know, I'm praying for a job. I'm praying for a, a husband or a wife. And I'm not really praying for the Holy Spirit. I mean, I don't even know what that means. And what am I going to do with that? Like, I just need a car. You know, so what is this deal, the Holy Spirit? And what does it mean that he will give the Holy Spirit? Well, let's talk about that. Because it's actually better than the car. And it's better than the spouse. And it's better than any good thing that God could give us, the Holy Spirit. So let's think about it. So the Holy Spirit is actually God. You know, God is Trinity. Father, he's God the Father, God the Son, Holy Spirit. He's one being existing in three co-equal persons. 
And all three are equally God. A lot of times the Holy Spirit gets kind of left out of that. He's kind of like this, when we hear Holy Spirit, we think of a, ooh, a little like force or something. But he's a person, he's a being, just like Jesus is, just like God the Father is. He's as much God as Jesus is God, as much God as God the Father is God. In fact, the Holy Spirit is the one who when you and I, if you choose to become a Christ follower, and we begin a relationship with God through faith in Jesus, accepting what he offers as a gift, his forgiveness and all that, his presence in our life, we become a Christian, then the Holy Spirit is the one who takes up residence in our life, takes up residence in our being. And he's the one who is with us in that sense. He's the the hands-on part of the Trinity that works in our life. So he's the one who convicts us about what's right and wrong. He's the one who transforms our life. He's the one who gives us guidance and comfort. He's like, that's the Holy Spirit. But he's also involved in our prayer life in a way that we may not understand and appreciate. But every time we pray, the Holy Spirit is involved in that. Not only as part of the answer to those prayers, but even in the translation of those prayers to God, which is what we read about in the book of Romans 8, or in the book of Romans chapter 8. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Now, what is our weakness? We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans, And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. So God knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. So the Holy Spirit is involved in our prayers. And when I first heard, I mean, for years, actually, with this passage, what I thought the passage meant was, is that sometimes we don't know how to pray. Like a lot, most of the time, we do know how to pray. Like, we know, like, we got it going on, we know what we need, and we're praying, God, would you do this? Because, like, on the car illustration, I don't only know the car, I know God, I, I really think it'd be great if it was European and a convertible, right, or whatever, or I want this kind of spouse, or I want this kind of healing, or I want this kind, like, we know how to pray. I want a job, whatever. But sometimes... We don't know how to pray, and when we, like, we're confused, and when we don't know how to pray, we throw up our hands, and the Holy Spirit then comes and says, okay, dude, I'll help you out. But that's not what the passage says. The passage says one of our weaknesses as human beings is this. It doesn't say when we don't know how to pray. It's we don't know how to pray. We think we know how to pray, but we don't know how to pray. And the reason we don't know how to pray is because our perspective is so limited, I mean, we think we've, you know, we got it figured out, but think as finite human beings, our perspective is so tiny, so limited, and God's perspective is eternal. God's perspective is perfect, and therefore what the Holy Spirit does for us with that in mind is to say, hey, I'm not just going to do what you want. I'm going to do what's best within overall perspective, within eternal perspective. He translates our prayers into that which will work out for our good ultimately, And that really is a much better thing. It gets confusing sometimes, but it's much better. It gets confusing because sometimes we can't understand why God doesn't just do what we want. But think about it like this. Let's say uh, you're a parent again. We've done that a lot today. Let's say you're a parent, and you've got a 10-year-old kid or a kid that's about to turn 10, 9-year-old, about to celebrate their 10th birthday. And let's say that 9-year-old about to be 10 comes to you, and they know exactly what they want for their birthday. So they say, Mom, Dad, here's what I want. And I want you to say yes before I ask. And you'd be like, well, no, sorry, I'm not going to do that. I'd like to know what it is that you want. Well, I want an assault rifle, like a fully automatic assault rifle, like, you know, where you have to do some things to it. I don't want just a semi, like I want, and you can choose. It can be an AR-15 or an AK, doesn't matter. I just want a fully automatic. Now, I know this is a dangerous illustration in Texas because there are some of you, since we're in Texas, are like, Man, I'd be so proud of my kid right then. I'd be like, of course I'll give you that. This is the best day of my life. You know, apple pie, praise Jesus, God bless America. This is awesome. You know, right? I get it. Um, But I think most of us, no matter how you feel about guns and all that stuff, most of us would say, hey, a nine-year-old about to turn 10, probably not, right? That's that's probably not going to happen. Maybe a Nerf gun or something, but not a fully automatic assault. But from that nine-year-old's perspective, They stomp their feet. They get upset. Why? Because why in the world? This makes all the sense of, because when you're that person, when you're in that nine-year-old brain, it fully fits your perspective why it's a perfectly good thing. Even though no good parent with bigger perspective would say, yeah, let's do it, 
right? Because you've got bigger perspective. That's God's commitment to us. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, okay, yeah, but look, the thing I'm praying for is not, I'm, I'm not praying for something stupid. <laughs> I'm not praying for, you know, I'm not a nine-year-old praying for an assault rifle. I, I'm praying for my wife who has cancer to be healed. I'm praying for a job, and I've been out of work for a year. I, I'm praying for my uh, friend who is struggling and is still struggling, and, you know, or I'm praying for myself, I'm praying for my health, and God's not answering those prayers, and I don't think that's like something crazy, and I'm not sure why God's not answering. Well, let's take that a little deeper, because again, God is crazy generous. He will always answer our prayers according to what is ultimately best for us within his overall perspective, but here's what that means. It means there really are some different ways, and this was an outline I got when I was in college from a friend or from a pastor that I thought was really helpful for me, and it's been helpful these years, is how that God, yeah, he will always answer prayer, but he won't always just answer yes, let me do what you want. He'll answer one of four ways, either no, slow, grow, or go. So let's think about these a little bit. First of all, no. Sometimes we ask for something and God says no. Doesn't mean he won't do something else, but to what we want, he says no. Or we want a change of circumstance, he doesn't change our circumstance, he leaves us there. He says no, and no's are hard because our perspective makes it think like, well, that doesn't make sense. Like I remember when I was very uh, new at being a senior pastor, when I had first uh, become a senior pastor of this church, and uh, we were... Uh, had a you know, big vision to, to reach our community. At, at that time, 650,000 people in a 10-mile radius, now a million people, uh, by the way, in a 10-mile radius of our church, and we want to you know, connect everyone in one way or another, and how are we going to do that? And we had known for a while that we were landlocked in the building that we were at um, over behind Target here in Plano by, Legacy, uh, by uh, um, Parker in 75, and we were out of room and out of space and all that kind of stuff, so we knew we needed to take some steps. And Right around that time, knowing that we needed to do something, uh, right around the corner, a, uh, the theater, a th movie theater had opened up and that we thought was, would be perfect. It was not adjacent to the campus, but it was just around the corner and thought, man, this would be great and we could do like a really cool overflow over there because we're out of room, you know, in the worship area for adults. We could do youth ministry over there. We could make it, you know, it'd be great. Like this is obvious no-brainer. God's going to say yes to this. So we prayed. We went through the whole process of that, you know, buying that theater. And, and we went, when I say we went through the process, I mean, we did all the inspections. It was, everything was in the court of the, of the seller, and if they said yes, then we're obligated to buy this theater. They had, I don't remember if it was 60 days or 90 days or whatever to say yes. So we're praying like crazy that we'll get the yes and we'll be able to buy this theater for this price. And day after day after day, there's no answer, no answer, no answer from the seller. And I was getting more and more frustrated. And I remember, I remember going over there and walking around the perimeter of that building and praying and saying, God, this is for you, and why aren't you working, and this is for your glory, and, and it's your church, and why don't you get with the program, and, you know, let's make this happen, and, you know, all that kind of stuff, because I don't think you're getting how good this is going to be. And then about 40 or 50 days into this 60-day period, as we got more perspective, realized, oh, man, this would be bad. Like, this would actually, it's not adjacent, it actually wouldn't solve our bigger problems, uh, and it doesn't move us to a visible place where we have room to grow. We're not thinking big enough. We need to think bigger than we're thinking, and this would be a disaster if this happened. So then, for the last 10 days, my prayers changed to, God, ignore everything I said, <laughs> and, uh, and now do this, like, don't let it happen. Like, please, don't let this happen, and, and guess what? You know, the 10 days is there. The seller didn't get back in the time frame under the contract, so we were able to pull out of it, which is why we moved to relocated to Legacy and all that, and then able to start the campuses, and none of that would have happened, or it would have been a lot more difficult. It would have been a big step backwards, even though at the time it felt like a big step forwards, as perspective catches up. You know, when there, there are times where we're praying for something, and from our perspective, we can't imagine why it would be bad. 
and then God does the thing, and it's not what we want. And when that happens, and I understand that, like, you know, this is an illustration of the one I just gave of my perspective catching up to God's perspective, and you realize, oh, yeah. But there's other prayers I've prayed over the years, like my dad, who just died of ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, a few months ago. I remember when he was being diagnosed, and what's the problem? The one thing we prayed is, God, anything but ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, anything but that. That was our prayer. And that's not what happened. We got the diagnosis. It's Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. Why? My perspective is not caught up with the why yet. But when that happens, you know what? Our job is to trust. That until my perspective matches God's perspective, and it may not be till heaven, I'm gonna trust God's character and I'm gonna trust his wisdom because he has perspective I don't have. With a no. Other times God will say, um, slow. And, you know, slow, you ever notice God's kind of slow? You know, like you're praying for something, we're all urgent about it, and God doesn't seem to be that urgent about it, which is why there's not big, huge fingernails flying down from heaven, because he's not like biting his nails, even though I'm biting my nails, and I'm like, God, come on, you know, get with it, let's come on, you know, this is urgent. And God has this thing where he's eternal, and he has perfect timing, and his perfect timing doesn't necessarily match my sense of perfect timing, and then the same way, when my perspective doesn't understand that, I can choose to trust his timing. Another reason, another thing God will say to us, another answer is grow. Because God ultimately isn't just interested in giving us stuff. God is interested in transforming our lives and growing us and helping us be the people he created us to be. And so sometimes he'll answer, grow. Now, this is multifaceted. Uh, you know, sometimes grow is, it feels like a no because we're praying God to change something, to change a situation to heal a situation or resolve a situation, and he says, no, he leaves us in it, and one of the reasons he can do that is to grow us, because we grow in those situations in a way we will never grow another way. Like the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, he prays that God will take away a thorn in the flesh, he calls it. It must have been some physical or emotional struggle that he had, and God, he says, God, please take this away from me, and God says, no, not going to do that because I want my strength to be perfected in your weakness, meaning you will not be the person that I really want you to be and that you want you to be without this struggle. And therefore, I'm gonna leave the struggle because God's interested in growth even more than just doing what we want because that's what's best for us ultimately. Another way growth shows up is sometimes we're just not ready for the request and we need to grow up. Like maybe you're praying for a spouse and you're a Christ follower, but you're not really walking with God that much. Yeah, if, you know, people talk about being on fire for God and that sounds good to you, but you'd love to marry somebody like that, but that's not really you right now. But you're praying that, that God guide me to a person like that, like somebody who's really godly, like who's really on fire for God. Like God, that's who I want. God, guide me to that person. Well, think about that. Why would God answer that? Because guess what? That person who is on fire for God, what are they praying for? They're not praying for you right? They're praying for somebody who is also on fire for God and is committed. And so why not become that person? Become the kind of person that you're praying to, that you'll be, and God's much more likely, right? So sometimes it's that sense of grow. Other times there are things in our life that are happening that are preventing our prayers from being answered, that we're the problem, we're the holdup. And the Bible lets us know that sometimes that's the case. Like Jesus said, hey, if you've got a conflict with somebody, a personal conflict, and you're not doing your part to deal with it, and you come to pray, and you come to worship, you know what? Just go deal with that issue, and then come. Do your part of deal. That's how much God cares about our relationships and conflicts. Uh, in 1 Peter 3, in a, in, a, in a context where Peter was writing to the Roman people who become Christians out of a Roman culture where men were tended to be abusive to their wives, he says, hey, look, husbands, if you're abusing your wives and then you're coming and you're praying and you're thinking God is gonna do all this stuff for you, um, think again. Start treating your wives with respect. Stop abusing them and then it'll clear the way for God to hear your prayers. So sometimes it's that. Other times, the book of James says if we ask with selfish motives, if we're going down a selfish, sinful pathway, why would God enable that pathway? Um, he'll enable a godly pathway, a, an unselfish pathway, and so, so sometimes it's us that's the holdup, and we need to grow. There's some things we need to change in our life. And other times, God says, go, let's do it. 
Yeah, we're praying for something. All right, let's go. Let's do it. And that's always fun, right? And it's not just fun for us. It's fun for God, too. When everything lines up and what we're praying for actually does fit his overall perspective and it's in the right time and all that, then, yeah, let's go. Let's do this. And it's amazing to me how often actually we get to go when you think about it in a big picture because that's God's heart. He loves go. I mean, he's committed to doing what's best, but he loves go, too. So, what we want to do is pray, and we're about to do that because God does answer prayer. He may answer no, slow, grow, or go, but he will always answer prayer. Every time we ask, he will answer. Every time we knock, he will open. Every time we seek, we will find. But notice we do have to ask that God responds to prayer. James, in the book of James, it says, you have not because you ask not, meaning there are things that God will not do in our life if we don't ask, if we don't pray. God responds to prayer. So I want us to pray. So when you got in, or when you came in the room that you're in, uh, unless you're at home right now, um, you got a little three by five card. Please pull that out. There should be hopefully a pen around you somewhere. And what I want you to do is to write uh, one thing, one prayer request on that card. Like there's one thing in my family, in my own life, in my job, in my finances, in my health, or you know, whatever, spiritual stuff. God, here's one thing. Now, there's a reason I'm going to ask for one thing, okay? But here's one thing that I'd like to pray for. We're going to take that to God, who's the most generous, loving being on the planet, who will do what's best. And we're going to have time to pray. But the reason I want you to write it out is not just for this prayer. I want you to leave it, if you're comfortable, uh, in the lobby when you leave, um, because I want to pray along with you. Along, uh, I and the elders of our church, elders are like the spiritual leaders of our church, the board of directors with the spiritual component. And in the book of James, it says that God just listens to the prayers of elders in a, you know, significant way. So we want to pray along with you. And every year at this time, I go on a study break for a few weeks, and I'm about to do that. And I take these requests. Now I share them with the elders, but um, and it's just our honor to be able to pray alongside. It's amazing to see all the ways God has answered over the years. We've done this for, I don't know how many years now, and it, it's just always a really cool thing. And when God does answer, email me, let me know. If you're online right now or at home, um, just email me the, uh, your request so that we can get that in. But let me give you a minute just to get started right now, and go ahead and write out what is that one thing that you'd ask God to do for you. Let's go ahead and write it out, and then we'll do something with it. I know we're still writing, or a lot of you are still writing these out, and please continue. Um, but what I, what I want us to do with these is, is take them to God. And if you are open to us uh, sharing uh, that with us, you can do it anonymously if you want, or you can write your name. God will know either way who you are, and uh, you can drop it at the lobby um, on our way out when the service is over. But for now, uh, let's pray. Let's take these to God. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your incredible generosity to us that you will always answer. You will always be found by us. You will always open the door. And as a loving father, you just love to give. And you even give your Holy Spirit to 
Help make sure that what we're asking for really are good things, the best things. And so, Father, now, in these moments, hear our, hear our request. And, and I invite you, just in your own words, before God, just quietly just share your request to him, that the one thing. Lord, thank you for your delight in hearing these requests. That these are not impositions, they're delights for you. And Father, we ask that you would work. And in, in, in where maybe some of us are pretty disillusioned in the way things are happening with what we've been praying, God, would you give us faith, if that's us, to, to trust you until our perspective matches your perspective? And would you keep us in faith so we can continue to pray that you'll resolve, you'll answer within your time, within your will, what's best for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.